some trees, a sight to behold. Some trees are very long lived. Oak trees, for example, can live for a thousand years. They grow upwards for 300 years, as seen here. They grow in full maturity for another 300 years. And then for 300 years, they gracefully decline. You can see the signs of aging in these early ancient trees with these stag headed branches with no leaves. Here, the crown has retrenched to considerably less than its former glory, but enough to sustain a tree of this size. So, trees start with intact trunks, and these gradually become hollowed, as you can see here, with masses of stag headed branches, and the root system alters too. These are all signs of aging, an important part of life of a tree. Ancient trees have hollows, an evidence of fungal colonization. Big hollows, little hollows, sometimes you can't see that there is in fact a hollow inside. While usually we think of large trees as being those that hollow, it's actually a feature usually of age. For example, this elder Sambucus nigra is relatively small, but you can see that it is hollow in two. It is actually quite an aged tree. And another example would be the hollows that you can get even in bonsai trees. Now, when Alan Rayner and I were writing our book on decay of wood in 1988, we thought of five main ways that fungi actually colonize wood. And I think th these are still probably the fine five main ways. I've listed them here really largely in uh, the order that they began to be studied historically. So at the top of the list, we've got heart rots. Now, in the 1800s, the German foresters asked the, the biologists, why is it that our trees that we want to sell for wood are becoming rotten in the middle? We, can, we can't sell these. Please find out what it is and stop it. And uh, of course, to start with, they didn't know that it was fungi. And that, that soon became uh, evident. And uh, of course, they never found out how to stop decay. Heart rot and the idea of pathogens and killing was actually inextricably interlinked to start with. And there was the heart rot pathogenesis uh, decay sort of idea until I suppose probably perhaps the 1950s or 60s when actually works on heart rot actually did not progress. In fact, very little had been found out uh, then at all until we we took up the reins perhaps six or seven years ago. Obviously study of pathogens has continued unabated because of their importance. Now I am going to talk about heart rots, um, I'm not going to talk about pathogens today. Anyway this was the focus for a long time but then in the, the late 60s early 70s along came a North American um, scientist Alex Shigo who said yes but this isn't the only way that trees are colonized by fungi, they're colonized by wounds. And he really emphasizes, and it was, it was a good step change to make, to, to point this out. Um, then in the early 1980s, along came Body and Rayner, and they said, ah, yes, but in natural colonization, there's another way in which fungi colonize. They are actually already present in attached branches and develop when the opportunity presents itself. Um, so I will talk about this. So my main emphasis today is going to be on heart rots and on colonization from latent propagules. But also there's a, a fifth way in which fungi colonize, and that is the secondary colonizers, those which come in after the initial colonizers have begun the decay process. And I'll touch upon that as well. So to start with, let's think about heart rot. Why is it important? Well, of course, our arborists, are, are really interested in heart rot from a safety perspective. People are often worried that hollow trees are going to fall down and um, either injure or kill somebody or, or damage property. Actually, um, very often these trees are very stable because as you've seen from the diagram early on, trees, when they get old, they tend to grow, if you like, downwards. They're, they're shorter and fatter, a bit like humans perhaps, um, and, and, and often more stable. Uh, than, than they, they would have been had they been 
uh, at their full height at maturity. But anyway, um, safety issues are, are, are not something for me as an ecologist to dwell on. There's some for somebody much more qualified in that area. What I want to think about is ecologically why are heart rocks and hollows important? They're important uh, for nutrient cycling. There's a huge volume of wood locked up in these central tissues and, and, and in there are nutrients which, which are not available to the tree. But by breaking these, the wood down, uh, fungi release these nutrients. And this is presumably taken up directly by the tree because you can see that you get often uh, roots growing down from higher up in the tree into the, the rotten wood. He, he, this wood, he, this rotted wood here looks really to all intents and purposes like soil. You can see the masses of roots and presumably these are soaking up the mineral nutrients. Um, it, it's obviously an important habitat for fungi and this includes some threatened species just such as the rare oak polypore Buglossoporus percursinus. Um, this, this is a, a pretty rare fungus worldwide. I think probably the world's stronghold is Windsor Great Park, where I've been lucky enough to be able to do uh, some of the research. Um, the tooth fungi, Hirisium species, also are pretty rare in Europe. I know less so in uh, North America, where, where you will see them much more frequently, but, but for us, they are quite rare. And as well as fungal habitat, rotting, hollowing trees, are important habitat for other organisms, such as vertebrates. Worldwide, over a thousand species of birds and mammals are dependent upon this habitat uh, for, for their very existence, effectively. And it's also important for invertebrates. Again, in the UK, there are over 1,700 species which depend on this habitat. And this includes 15% um, of the rarest insects, um, such as the violet click beetle, Limoniscus violaceus. Now just a few examples here. Firstly, of, of hollowing and, and, and rot holes where you find invertebrates and then examples of the invertebrates themselves, um, ranging from pseudoscorpion spiders, mites, um, various larvae, uh, beetles and uh, snails. Let's take a little closer look actually at the habitat of trees from, from a, an invertebrate's perspective. There's obviously the, the, these um, dry rot holes and damp rot holes, basal cavities, um, water-filled rot holes, fungal fruit bodies, be they brackets um, or mushroom shaped. All of these are important habitat for invertebrates, but so also are other features such as uh, broken branches, sun-baked wood, um, saprons on the bark, lightning strikes, damage by browsing animals, so on and so forth. Um, different invertebrates are associated with these different habitats. So these dead or dying features of trees, of these veteran trees are so very important from an environmental perspective and should not be considered as a bad and unfortunate thing. They're a very important and essential feature of our ecosystems. Now, there's a bit of a paradox in that in standing trees, most decay occurs in the heartwood, in those central tissues, but on the forest floor or when, when a trunk is fallen, the most rapid decay occurs in the sapwood. So why is this? Let's have a look at the different features of uh, functional sapwood and heartwood. Now, functional sapwood, which tends to be very often the outer regions of xylem, uh, around the outer regions of sapwood, around uh, the, the trunk, which transports water in the dead xylem cells, they're hollow cells, which often extend long distances. Um, in, in oak, for example, a, 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 a vessel, a xylem a vessel can be a meter or more in extent, but they, they extend longitudinally from the roots to the leaves where they move water. They're full with water. They move water up to the leaves from the soil. Those cells are dead, but they're associated with living cells always. And indeed, also there are medullary rays, which are full of parenchyma cells, living cells. Now, living cells can defend themselves against invasion by pathogens, for example, or uh, fungi who may not even be necessarily pathogenic. 
Also, the fact that the, the, the xylem is full of, of, of water means that it's got very low oxygen content and a high CO2 content. Um, this is inimical to the growth of most wood decay basidiomyces. In fact, lignin elysis, the breakdown of lignin, can't occur really in the absence of oxygen. So effectively, although there are nutrients there, it's low nutrient availability. The, fun the, the fungi cannot operate their, their systems for getting at those nutrients. But if we look at heartwood, it's a different situation because in the center of trees, there are, there are few, if any, living cells. Um, it's the central tissues begin to dry out as branches break and air enters. This means the oxygen content increases, carbon dioxide decreases, a much nicer scenario for fungal growth. And so carbon and mineral nutrients are available in the woody cell walls for those fungi. But of course, uh, oh, there's a downside to heartwood in that some tree species, uh, in the center of the trees, they're full of tannins and polyphenols, which are inhibitory. But nonetheless, despite these inhibitory chemicals, this better gaseous regime, lower water content, means that fungi can grow in the heartwood in the standing tree. Now, <clears throat> when trees are felled or fall, the situation is different. Um, cells die quickly, water content uh, decreases as the wood dries and oxygen increases, carbon dioxide decreases. So it's a better environment then. And because of the absence of the inhibitory chemicals, the sapwood on the, when the wood is on the floor is a, a much better place from a, for, from a fungal perspective for fungi to grow. And that explains this, what was an apparent paradox. So how do fungi get into the middles of trees? Well, they can get in through dead attached branches, those with no heartwood and those with heartwood. They can track down if there's heartwood. Um, so for an example, in oak stearium gausopartum, you'll find in sapwood um, and it's a heart rotter too. So that's a, an easy way to get in. Then of course, another obvious place is through large wounds where heartwood has become exposed. And you get hints of this very often when you see fruit bodies on, on these large exposed bits of heartwood, for example, latiporus here. But as a warning, please don't necessarily think that this is the way that these particular fungi necessarily got in. It's the way they're getting out, the way they're, where they're fruiting, but they didn't necessarily get in here because when they entered the center of this tree, this wound likely was not even there. So you have to be cautious in your interpretation. Now, another classic way that, that, that fungi can get in is if they've colonized a dead twig and of course trees grow outwards and they would engulf the base of the dead twigs and of course the fungi that are in them and a classic example of this is a Echinodontium tinctorium the Indian paint fungus which um, we don't really get in um, in Europe but you but you do over here and you can see it uh, surrounding these these dead uh, twigs sticking out also fungi can colonize from the roots. They can arrive as mycelial cords and rhizomorphs. Well, at least some fungi can, and obviously the armillaria is the classic example here. Um, sapwood may, may be damaged and they can get in, or if they've got pathogenic ability, they can get in that way. And they can also spread sometimes via root grafts where roots of adjacent trees have grown together and fused. And it's the classic way that heterobasidion spreads by roof grafts. So the fungus can become established in a coniferous plantation when spores land on um, a major wound, perhaps, um, which has come because of, oh, I don't know, animal activity or damage by um, forestry machinery, it can land on the, on the wounds or indeed on cut stumps, and the fungus can become established. Now, because these trees uh, root systems are, are grafted together, when the fungus has become established, it can get to an adjacent tree without having to go through that hostile environment of the soil, it can go straight through the roof grafts into an ancient tree, be it from um, a standing tree or from a cut stump. Um, and very often when areas are replanted, the, 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 the young, saplings are planted adjacent to uh, a felled stump, stump to protect from the prevailing environment. 
And uh, this is another great way in which the fungus can spread into the young tree. And of course, um, the, the situation is controlled now using Flebia, Flebiopsis gigantea to, to kill Heterobasidion uh, at the time of felling. Now, heart rot fungi exhibit a range of selectivity. Some are extremely selective, such as uh, the rare oak polypores I've already mentioned, Bugloceporus quercinus, uh, and Fistulina hepatica, the beefsteak fungus, which you find on oak and the closely related sweet chestnut. Others are widely occurring, such as armillarias, and this is probably because of that they have uh, either a lot of pathogenic ability or, or some ability. And then there, there are others which are strongly selective for some tree genera, but do occur on others. And I think it, it, I'd probably put Latiporus sulfureus in this category in the past. You find it, for example, on, on oak, but also on a very different uh, tree, yew, Taxus baccata. Um, now, the likelihood is that, that, that they may be different species uh, on, those, on those two trees. Um, which look very similar morphologically as far as the fruit bodies are concerned, but uh, genetically they're very different. And I think in North America, it's now known that there are at least four species of Latiporus, mostly called Latiporus sulfureus. And I think worldwide there, there's probably a dozen or so, at least. Now, we started to work on heart rot uh, of oak, but only recently, and we've done a lot more work on beech, so I will concentrate on beech, but just to mention a few points about oak first, and that is, I've already said that it's got this heartwood, which is rich in tannins and, and, and polyphenols, and a very nasty environment, and associated with that is the fact, I think, that if you wanted to list, and I've quickly done that here, the main fungi which you'll see fruit in at least on, on, oak, tr on, on oak trunks and presumably associated with the decay of um, heartwood, uh, it's, it's, a short, it's a short list of fungi. On the other hand, if we do the same for beech, so beech does not have distinct heartwood, not full of, of tannins or, or other polyphenols, um, it's sometimes called ripe, ripe wood. Much longer list of fungi which immediately spring to mind as colonizers. And I think this is related to the, the compounds that are in heartwood. Now I'm going to tell you about beech. But to start with, let's cut open a few trees, take a few slices and you can see these here and just look at the lines uh, patterns that you get. So this pattern actually, it's actually called red heart because at early stage it's very red colour. These particular lines are actually produced by the, the tree. They are a much more, much denser um, wood. Now what I suspect happens is that a portion of the tree becomes aerated at some point whereas and all of this at the time of aeration of this initial bit would be still uh, this would all be functional sapwood with, with some living cells and the living cells can make a tissue um, which protects effectively the sapwood, uh, which is important in moving water from the roots to the shoots, protects the sapwood um, from desiccation. But later on, more becomes aerated and the same process goes on and on to give this pattern. So that, those lines are produced by the tree, but most of the other lines are produced by fungi. So if we look here, there's a line and here and here, lots and lots and lots of lines. These are interaction zone lines. These are the, the places where fungi are fighting each other. Each of these lines circles a piece of fungal territory, a bit like how uh, we encircle our, our, our homes um, very often with a wall or a fence or hedge or something, or medieval cities built walls around them to protect themselves. And it's a bit analogous to that. Sometimes there are lots of different individual fungi, individuals of different species, all the same species. Sometimes there are just a few. In this case, there's a, a, an individual occupying a huge piece of territory and there's a, a second individual there. We also get other patterns like this dark sort of staining. Now this is wet wood. And I don't call it wet wood. There's a, a bacteriological pathological condition called bacterial wet wood, which you get in things like willows and poplars. This is wet wood, water has got in from higher up. And in this tissue, 
we tend to find bacteria, not fungi, because although the wood initially dried out as the heartwood began to dry, it's got wet, uh, and that's a miracle for fungal growth. Now, <laughs> this, this picture still fills me with excitement. This was the very first tree that we studied. And um, Ted Green at, at Windsor had, had found this tree, which had been recently felled, and he got it reconstructed on the, on the floor, as you can see here. And so we thought, well, you know, how are we going to analyze this? Lots of head scratching. And uh, we decided that we'd take slices from each of, of these sections. And this kind chap here uh, did all the slicing, which was a wonderful job. And uh, my student Emma Gill Martin and I set about analysing the uh, the structure. In fact, obviously Emma did most of the work. So here are the slices from from this tree, and you can see the patterns. This this red heart pattern that you've already seen, and we made isolations, uh, and we could identify the fungi either morphologically or uh, molecularly, and we found things like Jacanda arduster, Trametes vesicolor, Hyphaloma fasciculari and Armillaria gallica, those, those are predominant in, in the main parts of the trunk. And I'd been told that, you know, this tree had only just come down. I thought, well, that's a bit odd. Why has it got the, these fungi, which I would think of as at least secondary colonizers? But of course, the stupidity of me thinking that it hit me within seconds because this tree had been standing for hundreds of years. And although it had only just come down, it had been decaying internally for a very long time, so it's not surprising that any primary colonizers might have been replaced during succession in these communities. And that's why I expect that we're getting these, what we'd associate with later colonization. Obviously, Armillaria gallica is a relatively early thing coming up on the base. Um, Hyphaloma fasciculari uh, tends to come in much later on, on, on fallen wood, wood than what I would have said a few years ago. But as you'll see, as I, as I tell more, it turns out that this looks like it can be a heart rotter um, from the from the from the get go. Now I'm just going to flash through a few of these trees which we analysed. We analysed, I, I think, eighteen or nineteen, something like that. In the end, um, I'm not going to talk about that many, but just to give you a, a, a bit of an insight. So here are some early stages of this of this red heart. It, it's not really quite as purpley as that normally. And near the base, you can see how decayed it is. Now, the fungus that was predominant in, in this decay was Foliota sclerosa. And yet that's not a fungus that would immediately spring to mind as being important in decay based on fruit bodies. Here's a different tree. This time we can see the presence of Kretschmeria deuster, the ascomycete. Um, and also this wet wood. And, and there's a patch here of a uh, of a foliota species again. Here's another rather different situation, not very decayed at the base. At the top, Lotus cornucopii. Ah, and in this region here, a foliota species. I think you're probably getting the hang of this. Oh, but look what else there is. Very early stages of decay, not very decayed at all, but Steerum hirsutum was present. Normally think of that as a secondary colonizer. And Ganoderma aspersimal, that we would think of as a heart rotter. Another tree with Kretschmeria in, and you can see uh, what, what Kretschmeria tends to do to trees. It, it often uh, rots very rapidly and weakens the wood in, in the roots, and, and these are tend to be uh, windblown. That foliot is there again. Here's another one. Ganoderma, this is perhaps what we might have guessed, a, a, large tree hollowed by Ganoderma with one or two other things. Now, of course, it, it takes a long time to deal with those 18 or 19 trees, and we can't get a full picture of, of, of all of the fungi involved. So we set about um, coring trees as well. We cored 55 beech trees, uh, as you can see here, with appropriate um, sterilization by flame sterilizing, alcohol sterilizing, and extracted these cores from the centers of the, of the trees and then cut them up into tiny bits and plated them onto agar to find what fungi were present. So we have three different ways of finding out what fungi are doing heart rot. We can look at fruit bodies is the obvious one. 
Uh, then we can do the, the slicing, which we've done to get detail of the community structure. And then thirdly, we can deal with rather more samples by taking cores. Do we get the same picture from these three methods? Well, if we look in the literature, we can see what, what fruit bodies we might expect. But you'll notice actually that we're getting from the coring and the sectioning quite a few fungi which would not be suggested as being important in the decay of heartwood based on fruit bodies. There are lots of them, as you can see here. So it's really important not just to judge based on fruit bodies. It's the mycelium that's important. You'll also notice, however, that there were three fungi, or three main fungi, which we didn't find, but which the literature would suggest would be present. So Meripolis giganteus, we did not find. Now Meripolis actually tends to be a colonizer of woody roots. And so that's why we probably didn't pick that up. It doesn't perhaps grow too much up usually into the, into the trunk. But here are two fungi, which perhaps you might have expected, Fomis fermentarius and Fomitopsis panicula. These are very common in continental Europe, uh, but actually less so in Britain. Now, we do get Fomis fermentarius very commonly on birch, um, and you do see it on, on beach, but not to the extent um, that you see in Europe. And we didn't pick it up on our trees. And Fomitopsis panicula, this is interesting, I think, Fomitopsis panicula, you see it everywhere in Europe on beach and spruce and the like. But I've rarely seen it. I've seen it a few times in Britain, but very rarely. You know, we're so close. We're 22 miles away. Why don't we have that fungus as a common decayer here? It's been suggested that maybe it's because Ganoderma is dominant here. But you get Ganoderma common on the continent too. So I don't know. OK, let's move our attention then to the colonisation of wood from latent propagules, which was the fourth um, way of colonizing that I had on that list at the beginning. Now this comes from an early piece of work, work that I did when I was a postdoc in, in the 1980s and the first time people had really looked at the community structure in attached branches and we looked at oak in this case. So we, we cut down oak branches which usually have fruit bodies on there, you can see Voluminia comedens fruiting on the underside of a branch and again we, we operated this practice of slicing and uh, recording the patterns in wood. We isolated from each of these decay regions. Um, FS stands for functional sample. This part of the branch was still living and operating in movement of water. They, they, there's a, a, a actual branch slice from somewhere around, around here. And so we plated out these fungi to find out what was there. And when we had the same species, we, we pa paired them together. If they were um, the same individual, because fungi are individuals like you and I, they can recognize when they're self and non-self. If they were the same individual, they grow from their initial inocular, meet in the middle, fuse and, and remain as one mycelium. But if they're different individuals, they grow together, they meet, they fuse momentarily almost, recognize they were non-self and then produce an interaction zone between them. So using that, we could see where the same individual fungi were. And we've mapped that on here. So VC1 indicates Voluminia comedens, individual one, and it extends right up here. So there's the scale bar, that must be five or six meters or so. VC2 is another long one, extending up to there at least. And then Pinophora cosina, there were six individuals, and again, fairly long. Now, this somewhat surprised us because this branch had died, well, or, the, or become colonized, I shouldn't say died, some of it was still living. This branch had become colonized in, in apparently less than one growing season. How did these fungi ex ex attain these long lengths in such a short time? They struggled to do that under optimal conditions in the lab. And so we suggested they hadn't got in a wound even halfway along. They were there perhaps already. Now, I think you, you jump to this conclusion instantly nowadays. But let me take you back to the 1980s where people still believed that inside the trees and functional sapwood was sterile. Um, research on endophytes had just started to, to be mentioned, being done by a few people. 
Now it wouldn't surprise you to know that the fungi were already there, but as I say, at the time it did. And we suggested that there were propagules of these fungi sparsely distributed along these, uh, along the length of the xylem, but they couldn't grow out to any great extent because the xylem is full of water. And I've already explained that the Basidiomycete wood decayers don't cope well with those conditions. Now we see the same sort of thing uh, on beech trees, these strip cankers, which were evident in 1977, 78, 84, and 91, immediately the year following droughts. We've got these extensive strip cankers. That one is of Biscognioxia numbularia. This one is of Utipa spinosa, spiraling round following the xylem. And again, we mapped these, and you've got these quite long individuals. And actually, um, before I tell you more about, about the, the latency, let me just mention that there's actually a, an intimate association uh, between the tree and Biscognioxia numbularia. We inoculated them to some trees, which you can see here, there's an inoculation point. And look at this, a couple of years later, this huge increase in, in growth in the vicinity of these inoculations. And you can see the annual rings are, are very much larger near where the Biscognioxia was inoculated compared to where it wasn't. And it, we grew the fungus uh, on agar, there, this fungus growing Biscognioxia on agar. And in this, paired plate here, we actually put beech callus culture just here. And look, at th these had grown for the same amount of time. Look at how far that fungus had got when there was no beech callus, and look how far it had got when there was beech callus. So what we found was that the presence of beech tissue stimulates the growth of Biscognioxia, and we also weighed the callus, and we found that the presence of the weight of callus is much greater when the fungus was present than when it wasn't. So there's quite a tight interplay sometimes. Anyway, back to the story of latency. We suggested that the, the, the fungi was already present in some sort of propagules in the, the sapwood, couldn't grow out because of high water content. So we tested this hypothesis. Actually, we tested it in beech, even though we developed the hypothesis in oak. So we chopped down branches from the tree, cut it in, them into sections. The branches, as far as we could tell, were perfectly healthy with full, full leaves on. Cut them into sections. Sometimes we put a slab of agar on the end so that it didn't get wet. Sometimes we just had a plastic over the end with different sized holes cut to allow different drying rates. And in some, we removed the bark um, to, so that we could preclude the idea that the fungi were growing inwards from the bark. And this is a summary of effectively what happened. So, um, when there was agar slab on the end, fully water saturated, no fungi developed, then you had a faster and faster drying regime, depending on the size of the area exposed at the end with the holes we cut. Um, with a very rapid drying, fungi did develop, but because it dried so quickly, they soon stopped growing. But in the Goldilocks conditions where it's just right, you can see um, this is typical hypoxyl and biscognioxia decay, the fungi had grown out and we demonstrate, demonstrated that they were already there. Now, later on, uh, in, in the 2000s, when molecular techniques had come around, remember the first work was in the 80s, when molecular techniques had come, we could develop PCR-specific primers, we could test for certain fungi. And so these were fungi which we wondered whether they were present. We tested them in a range of tree species, and if there was a plus there, then they were present in um, that wood. And you can see that for quite a few fungi, they were in all sorts of tree species. And then subsequent to that, with next generation sequencing, we've been able to remove wood from all, from all sorts of places under aseptic conditions, which I will emphasize. And we found that you, you get the, the heart rot fungi sometimes already present, all sorts of decay fungi, both white, white rotters, brown rotters, and soft rotters, and indeed a host of other incidental things too. Okay, now, the fact that you've got lots of species of fungi in trees might be a bit of a surprise because if these are gonna be the early decayers, let's look at what the early decay communities are of different tree species. So we talked about oak already, Sterium gaussipartum, I didn't mention, but that's a very common one, as is Peniophora sino and Voluminia comedians, which you saw on the branch diagram. Beech has its own community of early colonizers. Ash has a different one. These, these, as you can see, tend to be Ascomycetes. Hazel has Ascomycetes and Basidiomycetes. 
uh, etc. So that's their own community. And yet these are developing from that, shall we say, soup of uh, latently present endophytes within the sapwood. What's going on? Well, what I think happens is that these are different tree species uh, with different characteristics. They will dry down at different rates. And we've sub subsequently shown by experiment that rate of drying, temperature, gaseous regime, things like this, all affect which of those fungi actually develop from within the wood, from within that soup of endophytes to start off the decay process. Oh, well, I hear you say, with climate change, we might get differences in the fungi associated with particular tree species. And I think that that's absolutely right. We analysed a data set of fruiting records from um, southern England between about 1950 and 2010. And we certainly saw evidence of host shifts for the ear fungus Auricularia auricula judy. Now, if we look at the number of hosts that we see this species on, to start with, it's only on one host up until about 1978, and then suddenly it appears on two and then more. So it starts on Sambucus nigra, that's what it's usually associated with, but then suddenly we find it on Vagus sylvatica and lots and lots of other tree species. So if we look at the records, the percentage of records on Sambucus, 100% initially on Sambucus and then declining considerably up to the present. And if we look at Fagus, none on Fagus to start with and then increasing considerably. So it seems as if conditions now are not appropriate for this fungus to develop from latent propagules uh, in Sambucus nigra. It's probably in all of these tree species latently, but conditions now seem to be right in other tree species. Okay, so how do fungal communities change? You can see here lots and lots of individuals in uh, this felled tree. How do these, this is the community, how, does, how do communities change? Well, they change for, for various reasons. They change depending on the environment, obviously, uh, but also the main mechanism is uh, based on whether fungi can attack, defend, and how they do it. So they can attack at a distance. And this is shown in this agar plate here. If these fungi um, had not been antagonizing each other from a distance, they would have met in the middle, like what's occurred here. These two fungi have, have met just there, this one has, has, has going across in that case. But you can see these have not met even. They're producing chemicals, perhaps diffusible chemicals, volatile chemicals, which have inhibited each other. They don't meet. Second mechanism is hyphal interference. So there's a hyphophilibia gigantea making contact with heterobasidion and nosum. I've, I know some, I've talked about this already. Flebia has killed that compartment of that hypha of heterobasidion. And if there are enough places where they, they touch, then heterobasidion is completely destroyed. And I've already mentioned that that's the biological control of heterobasidion in commercial plantations. Now, another mechanism, mycoparasitism, where one fungus parasitizes another. For some fungi, this is the, the only way of feeding, but for, for the wood decayers, for example, Lenzites, um, Betulina, it is mycoparasitic on Trimetes vesicolor and tends to coil around and probably penetrate into the hyphae. And tr Trimetes vesicolor is very common wood decayer, Lenzites, Betulina, less common. Uh, so if it, uh, spores of Lenzites arrive on Trimetes, they can parasitize it and get hold of all of the territory that Trimetes occupied. And then they don't just use the Trimetes as food, they then can be wood decayers of that territory that Trimetes formerly occupied. And incidentally and interestingly, they can then extend their territory by fighting against adjacent fungi by other mechanisms, not parasitism. So these mechanisms that I've loosely called gross mycelial contact. Very loose, woolly terminology because we don't know all of the mechanisms involved, and I bet there are lots. And later on, we'll be able to, to, to divide this up in more detail. But here's an example. In this case, I'm actually showing fungi growing from wood blocks across a tray of soil straight from the forest floor. Um, this is Hyphalomus sulfur, uh, Siclari, sulfur tuft. 
they met just here. And you can see that um, they have fought. Fanarchiti is replacing Hyphaloma. And in a couple of weeks time, it completely replaces the fungus. Here are examples of the same sort of phenomenon on agar plates. Fungus has met there, the fungi have met there. This one has actually switched its morphological form to make these cords which grow over the surface, but it also grows through and replaces the fungus underneath. Here you can see enzymes exuded, um, very nasty environment has killed this mycelium, uh, but all, all, almost to get over it in a bridging like fashion, you can see that this fungus is making cords. Another example here, this fungus hypholoma um, battling with resinicium bicolor, and you can see that uh, all sorts of pigments are also being produced. So the outcomes of these deadlock uh, interactions, there are about four outcomes really. One is deadlock, one is replacement. So deadlock is when neither fungus gains headway. Replacement is where one fungus takes the territory of another, as you guessed. But interestingly, sometimes you only get partial replacement. One fungus starts to take the territory of another, and maybe the, uh, the, the, the fungus which is losing the battle, maybe it can turn on its defense mechanism. It's worked out how to, to defend uh, and stops the fungus making any more headway. Or maybe conditions have changed to change the balance. You also get this interesting situation called reciprocal replacement, where fungus A starts to replace fungus B in one region, and B replaces fungus A in another region. You can see a hint of this here. Growing on, it, uh, on soil, this is one fungus wood block growing out. Here's the mycelium of this one. But you can see the cords started to grow over that of this one. And actually, they do kill the cords that are in their vicinity. On the other hand, this one has come round here and is replaced, starts to replace this one in that region. So an interesting swiveling around. Now, not all fighters are as good as each other, obviously. It's a bit like a sports league. You get some teams that are at the top of the table. They, they tend to win most of the battles. There's the ones that sometimes win, sometimes don't. And there's the ones that tend to lose far more often um, than others. And so you get this hierarchy of combative ability uh, like that with fungi. And actually, you also get the situation where there, there are teams which don't even feature in these top sports leagues. They're perhaps down here off the bottom of the page. Um, but if on the odd occasion, they might get to play one of these higher up teams, they might even beat them. We sometimes call these giant killers and you, and you get giant killers in the fungal world, world too. So that's how communities change as, as re, with these battles that go on. And I, I've indicated here, the, I, I'm not sure whether this was from studies on agar. We tend to do all our studies on, on wood now, um, but I use agar plates because you can, you can see what's going on a little bit better. But you can see here a ranking, a rough ranking of competitiveness between the heart rot fungi with the R malarias and Biscogneoxia, not good fighters at the bottom, and things like Hyphaloma and Fomitopsis panicula as the great fighters at the top. So this is how our communities change. Now, outcomes of interactions do vary depending on conditions, whether it's occurring in wood or soil for those fungi which can grow out into soil. Differences in agar culture, which is why we don't really use agar culture in the lab now. The temperature regime, the moisture regime, the gaseous regime, all can affect interactions. How much food there is, how much wood there is, what the quality of it is, how well the cage is, whether there are other microbes present and whether there are invertebrates feeding on the fungi can all affect the outcome of the interactions. And I'll illustrate a couple of these here. So sulfur tough fungus hyphaloma against Flebia radiator. Flebia radiator is doing very well at 20 degrees, but look at 25, total shift in the balance. The hyphaloma has completely replaced the Flebia. Here we've got Trometes vesicolor against the Ascomycete daldinia concentrica. Trometes is replacing the daldinia. You can see that, in fact, I mean, again, in a couple of weeks, it completely replaces it. But if you make the agar such that it's hard to get hold of water, a bit harder here than normal, very hard here, you get a, a complete shift. And this time, Daldinia wins the confrontation. Ascomycetes tend to be better coping in low water content conditions. Now, here we've got some trays of soil. 
uh, the, with fung fungal mycelial cords growing. These are not grazed by fungi on the, these two. These are, uh, sorry, these are not grazed by invertebrates. These are grazed by invertebrates. So here we've got Resinicium against Hyphaloma. Resinicium is winning this battle. It's got to the Hyphaloma wood block and it eventually completely replaces it. But when there's grazing by Calendula, springtails, you can see the little dots here, which is the springtails, um, they eat all of the mycelium between, neither get to the territory other, and they carry on independently uh, in their wood blocks decaying. Another example, again, Resinicium, again, Hyphaloma, it's a different individual with Hyphaloma. Resinicium has got to here in this picture. In fact, it's got round to the wood block and again does replace it. This time, the feeding is by nematodes. So nematodes, these little tiny wormy things, um, which it's Panagrelis redivivus, the nematode, which inserts a little stylet into the hypha, like a little drinking straw and sort of sucks out the contents. And you can see again a shift here, Resinicium wins, here Hyphaloma wins. Okay, then finally turn into secondary colonizers. Fungi, which are good fighters, um, they tend to, to, to drive the communities and replace the early colonizers and then better fighters still will come in. Examples of, of good secondary colonizers from attached branches um, are Trimethes lysicolor, Jacandra, Dust Earth, Libia radiator, and uh, so I suppose Sterum Hirsutum too. However, you don't have to be a good fighter to do well. You can adopt different tactics. So Schizopora, oops, spelling mistake there. Schizopora paradoxa is not a good fighter, but you very often find it in the canopy. It's a stress tolerant fungus. It produces chlamydospores. So when the mycelium of all of these fungi have been killed, its chlamydospores will remain. And so that when the wood moistens up again, these can grow out and, and there it is, get in the wood, decay in the wood itself. So a different strategy completely. So there are many strategies during the decay of wood. So, so far I've talked about decay of the standing tree and decay of branches in the canopy. Now complete decay rarely occurs in the canopy or as a standing tree because as wood decays it weakens and winds will bring it down onto the forest floor. So what happens next? Well the story continues but that's I think something for another day. So on that note I'd like to thank absolutely everybody for the huge help that they've given uh, me in all of this work uh, over the years. Um, and I particularly thank Emma Gill Martin, who, who did most of the work on the uh, on the, the, the beech trees, the heart lot of beech trees. If you have been interested in what I've been saying, I have talked about some of these things a bit more. So on, on YouTube, uh, there's a, a video of a talk that I gave the, the Taylor White lecture at Berkeley a few years ago. Um, there are also some videos which you can look at on um, heart rot, colonization of sapwood volume wounding and um, sapwood in the absence of wounding. And, and I do have a Twitter account where I um, only tweet on, on fungi, basically, or interesting things about fungi. So I'd like just to take this opportunity very cheekily, not only to thank you for listening, but also to say, again, if, if you have enjoyed what I've said and if you do want to know more, um, I have written a book which will be coming out um, very early in 2021. Um, I've had most of the proofs now. The book's called Fungi and Trees, Their Complex Relationships, and it covers not only decay, but mycorrhizas, pathogens, and all sorts of things. And if you were interested, you can uh, pre-order it from the Arboricultural Association website. Thank you so much for inviting me and for listening. Thank you. So we're back. I hope we're back. Um, there are a few questions that have come in, and I, I want to uh, address those to Lynn. She can see them as well, but we're kind of moving up from the, the bottom here. I, you're identifying, uh, where Judy is asking, is this primarily microscopic identification, or are you using sequence uh, information? Yeah, so we do both. Um, the, so the work that we did when we started looking at communities in the 1980s, 
um, I, I learned to identify mycelia macroscopically from the culture characteristics and microscopically from the branching of the hyphae, et cetera, et cetera, by culturing from fruit bodies, because obviously in those days we didn't have any other method um, by which to identify them. But of course, it's very much easier nowadays because if you get a bit stuck, you can just extract the DNA and, and away you go. So both. Great. I, I don't think we can put the slide back up, but I, do you want to do another plug for your book? <laughs> that would be ask to do that. So that would be a bit cheeky, really, wouldn't it? No, no, I, I, you'll see. You're not alone. Go ahead. <laughs> OK, so yes. So I've, I've written I was nagged and nagged and nagged by arborists and people uh, interested in fungi and trees to, to write a book. And in the end, I was nagged so much that I said I would. And this was about five years ago. And then eventually in January, I finished it. And I was supposed to get the proofs in April, but because of COVID, um, I've only just got the proofs. And in fact, yesterday, I got the proofs of the last chapter. Um, so it will be coming out soon. I've just got to do the, the, the index. So uh, all sorts of different aspects. Uh, anything you can think about, tr about trees and fungi, including mycorrhizas and et cetera, et cetera. That's great, thank you. Uh, Juliana asks, are there consistent records of wood decaying fungi that only grow on old or ancient trees? And that kind of fits in with another question that is up higher about what are we looking at in terms of time scales, decades, centuries, all of the above. Mm, yeah, so um, <laughs> I, I should return, I suppose, to continental Europe really. Uh, where, where there are still patches of um, forest, which has been continuously forest for a long time. In Britain, we, we really don't have any. We have we have areas where there've been continuously tr trees, like in um, Windsor Great Park. Um, but certainly on the continent, there's evidence of fungi which really need a long, long continuity of, of trees. That's not quite what the question was, but I mean, I think that's the answer I'm going to give. Uh, and indeed, it, it, even in Britain, we find that certain species, like I mentioned that you'll find this strange, but the heresiums are rare in Britain and in much of continental Europe. Um, but the places we do find them are places where there has been long continuity, long history of trees. So I'm not quite answering the question about whether they have to be ancient trees necessarily, um, but certainly you have to have had long continuity of trees. And it's a great question about how long it, 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 these fungi are operating for. Um, if we think about oak trees, as I mentioned, oak trees live for perhaps a thousand years and are declining for the last 300 or so, you might, you might describe it like that. Um, and, and heart rot begins even sooner than that. And I think with, with some of these fungi, they do grow very slowly and, and are there for a long time. Like um, the beefsteak fungus, that, that's a very, very slow decayer and will be there for, I don't know, it could be hundreds of years. On the other hand, some of the other fungi operate on much shorter time scales. Um, so the hyphaloma, when that gets in, that, that rots pretty, that rots stuff pretty quickly. So we're operating on a whole different span of, of time scales within in this wood. And my mistake with that very first tree we looked at was thinking really on a human time scale, thinking this has only just come down. Why am I finding all these things which we find, expect to find later on? And I, and I wasn't thinking right there. They've been going at it for a long time. Those communities are developing in those standing trees over a very, very long time. And they, they'll change, they're changing too. They're going through their complete cycles. We only see it at one snapshot in time. There's a question from uh, Jason about heartwood. Does heartwood uh, allow trees engineering wise to be able to sway and move better or is it all detrimental? No, it's not, not, not right. I'm not, I, I'm not a physicist or an engineer, so I, I'd like to cover myself with that. Um, but what the arborists always say is that, that they, they like to liken um, hollow trees to the Eiffel Tower, which you don't see having any issues. It's, it's sort of hollow inside and that, that's not quite the right analogy, I guess. But um, when we had the tail end of a hurricane in, in the 1980s, uh, the arborists were clearing up all of these young trees, which had all been blown over. And um, the ancient, the veteranized hollowing trees were all still standing. Uh, and, and I think that uh, they do give old trees a structural advantage by being hollow. So I don't think it, it should never be thought of like this as a bad thing. Okay. 
Uh, there's a method, a question about methods. Uh, what do you do with those wood cores? How, how do you propagate the fungi from the wood cores? So we go along with a scalpel and chop up into tiny, tiny, tiny bits, and we have a parallel core, which we do the same with. Um, the, the first core, we plate all those bits out uh, separately onto agar and see what we can get to grow out. And where we failed, we then would extract DNA directly from the, uh, the parallel core um, from an equivalent region. And sometimes we do that from other regions just to check. So we, we, we do it by culturing and also by direct DNA extraction from the wood. Great. Um, let's see, we had a question about root grafts and, and how that works, uh, whether it's the fungus growing through the graft or how that works? So, so um, trees are very often connected when, when roots come together, and certainly in plantations where the trees are closely grown, um, the roots will graft together. Uh, and so the fungus can grow within, within, within the wood from one side of a graft straight through to another. And of course, heterobasidion is, is sneakier than some of the heart rot fungi because it, because it does kill living cells. So that gives it a bit of an advantage to, to get through and get into the heartwood. But I think the crucial thing about being able to grow through, through entirety through wood is that that fungus does not have to get out into that, 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 that horrible environment of the soil where there are lots of other organisms that, 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 that might attack it or whatever. Okay. Uh, just looking forward again. Uh, the question about Kretschmeria. Uh, and an opinion. Jack, if you're there, maybe you can present the question. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, enjoyed the, the talk very much. Thank you for sending it over the pond. My question is, uh, we have a Norway maple in our backyard that has a Kretzmeria dosta. Uh, during the spring, we had an arborist give us an assessment, and he advised that we trim the tree's branches to contain it within our property or cut it down altogether. He said the fungus develops in the tree very fast, and this is confirmed by the literature we've read. Um, just how fast is fast, and should we cut the tree as soon as possible to avoid any limb breakage incident? So I, I'm not an arborist. Uh, I'm not qualified to give you um, arboricultural advice. But, but Kretsch, and, and for most fungi, I, I would be ever so tempted to say, just, just hang on in there and see what it does. But the thing about Kretschmeria is um, that, it, that it does soft, a, a soft rot um, and the, uh, the, the wood very, even though you don't get very much decay in terms of percentage weight loss, um, the wood very, very quickly loses its strength. And I, I think that probably most arborists, if they see Kretschmeria ha have a big, uh, I won't say panic, that's not the right thing to say, but I think that their advice usually is to take tree, trees down because um, when you saw, you saw the typical situation in, in that fallen tree where, where it's gone for the, for the roots or um, for weakened the, the lower trunk. Uh, so perhaps what they might be suggesting is that um, you don't want it to come down on anybody else's property because they might sue you or whatever. Um, so I, I think caution is definitely the watchword there once you, when you do see Kretschmeria. So you, you may well want to listen very carefully to your arborist. Thank you. Uh, Matt has a question about uh, stopping the march of armillaria. The march of armillaria is my terminology, but uh, uh, they're on a neighbor's property. Can we keep them fenced in? <laughs> um, well, we're... <laughs> You, you didn't say what armillaries they were because obviously, I mean, I think the temptation is usually to think of, of, of armillaria as being a melia or something, which is, which is undoubtedly a killer. But remember things like Gallica, um, which, which is a prolific producer of rhizomorphs, but, but it isn't the killer that melia is. Um, Gallica goes for um, weak, weakened trees or, or, or dead wood, um, but I don't think you can keep a good fungus out, basically. So. So no, I don't think you can keep that armillaria next door. There's a question from Primrose, Primrose Boynton, about chemicals uh, that are responsible for antagonism at a distance. Primrose, do you want to come on and 
hear this yourself? I can see him, right? Hi, um, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I well, I've been thinking a lot about antagonistic molecules in yeasts recently. Um, and uh, I realized that this is probably a system that you know more about with these kinds of with these kinds of wood decaying fungi. And I'm wondering if there are similar molecules, if the, the 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 chemicals that are responsible for the kind of competition you described, that's like antagonism at a distance, are similar to these toxins people talk about in yeast, or if the system's similar, or if there's something similar is relevant. Right. I I I I'm not up on the literature in in yeast primrose, as you know. You're you're my expert when it comes to yeast. Uh, but the, the the types of chemicals that are commonly produced, we, we have listed lots of the things in, in in reviews which I can send to you. Um, but there are often things like terpenes and sesquiterpenes and ketones and things like that, and very often indeed uh, chemicals that uh, that plants produce when when they're grazed upon by invertebrates. So these are more general and not specific chemicals. Uh, we we have I can't, I can't answer that. Oh, okay. um, we, we we obviously don't know which partner in, in, in confrontation is actually making the chemicals because the, the, the fungi fight and we would take gases from the headspace. I see. And, and so we'd find we'd find out what was there, but we don't know which which of those fungi um, made the chemicals. You you might take a guess. Based on who was winning, but that would only it would be nothing more than a guess, um, and we also don't know what the activity of each of those chemicals is. Now, people would say, "Well, you you know you know you you have got a list as long as your arm of, of the volatiles that are produced," and people would say, "Well, you can go and buy those and get test it from you know, bottle on a shelf, test it against the fungus to see what effect it has." And we've always I resisted doing that. One is because I, I'm not particularly interested in, in, the, in the biochemistry or anything of it, but also because I think that it's probably usually not just a single chemical, single volatile. Which is okay. job. I think it's it's a bouquet of chemicals. So you'd have you've got to, you'd have to get your combinations right. So I don't think there's a straightforward answer to that. I mean, even if I knew it, I don't think there'd be a straightforward answer. No, I, I think you actually gave me the answer I was looking for, which is the system is is not a lot like the one I'm thinking of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> Good to see you, Primrose. Good to see you. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you'll get here someday. We'll be able to travel again, and you it's, can. It's a lot shorter from, now than it was. <laughs> yeah, I come up from Wheaton. Yeah, uh, there's a question also, and uh, you know, a number of us work on ascomycetes, and we end up with ascomycetes on wood that's very, very hard and tough. Do you have any thoughts on those? Yes. Um, so I think ascomycetes, the xylets, some of the xyleriaceous ascomycetes, I think, behave like honorary basidiomycetes in, in their, their uh, speed with which they can uh, decay wood and colonize wood and the size of the decay columns they produce. But I think m many other ascomycetes, and indeed some of the xyleriaceae too, uh, tend to produce much smaller decay columns. They occupy very, very tiny areas, but the crucial difference, I think, between ascos and basidios is that the, the ASCOs have a much better ability to cope with low water potential than do the basidiomycetes. So if you, if you grow lots of these things up in culture and alter the water potential, you'll find basidiomycetes can't cope with um, conditions worse than about minus four megapascals, whereas the ascomycetes, they can. And so uh, we, for example, in ash trees, we tend to see that, that the main colonizers are Hypoxylon rubiginosum and Daldinia concentrica. Um, ash is an extremely dry wood. And so that didn't surprise me in the slightest when we found that, that, that those were the main colonizers because they cope uh, with that environmental stress much better. Great. Uh, Susan asks if you ex expect urban trees and canopies to be different from those uh, with, or do they have a difference, urban trees versus uh, Forests. That is, a very, that is a very good question. Um, and I don't know the answer to that because I don't think that we've, I might, I'm racking my brain madly. Um, we, we have analyzed trees from 
parks when when trees have come down um we have we have done some slices from parks um but not roadside trees so i really don't know the answer to that i i i suspect the answer is that there's not very much different and you've, you've got your the, the main players are the main players of course the arborists know this and they have the they know what the uh, the dominant fungi are which cause problems in the centers of trees from the perspective of um worrying about whether whether you're going to get fall or not so i think that i think that there's not so much difference of course if we were talking about mycorrhizal fungi then that would be a different kettle of fish yeah. but, but it's certainly well known that you, you you get different communities um in urban situations than you do in in, in more um wooded forested situations great i think we're um yeah reading more about the biochemistry of this. That's one of the questions. I suspect your book will help with that matter. Maybe a little bit, but I emphasize again, I'm not a great biochemist. <laughs> okay, great, good. Well, I want to do two things. First, I want to thank you uh, for doing this and um, allowing us to interfere with your evening here. I, I'm going to be sending you one of the uh, things that we've worked on, which are, is the new book on the glass flowers. And uh, we also have rotten fruit and all sorts of other things in glass, but this is the flowers. And I pointed out because it, it has absolutely gorgeous uh, photographs of the models. So I will send you a copy. The rest of you, if you want a copy, you can uh, order it through the Harvard uh, Museum, uh, the Museum of Science and Culture, uh, or Amazon has it. So it's out. We were planning a big blowout to celebrate the book, but uh, that didn't happen because of our timing. Uh, the other thing I want to do, and I'm being, uh, again, a little bit uh, frivolous in doing this, I suppose, but I want to stop sharing and then I, I will, or I want to start sharing and then I'll stop sharing pretty quickly. I, I hope you can see the fabulous fungus fair and I'll put that up this way. Uh, this is my students in uh, biology of fungi, OEB 54. We've done this for many years now. Uh, I think this may be the 10th or the 11th year. It's next Saturday, 2 to 3.30, and the students are presenting virtually. You can register at the museum, and uh, this is the Harvard Museum of Natural History website. If you look up just Harvard Museum of Natural History, you'll be able to find this and uh, you'll be able to get on. Uh, these uh, students this year have done a, a whole variety of different presentations. There are three to four minute presentations on something that they've thought about with fungi. So uh, it's Unpredict unpredictable in certain ways and very predictable in other ways. So uh, I hope you'll join us. And uh, if there's a f any final comments, uh, you can join in with audio, but I think we're about at the point that we should let Lynn go. Lynn, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been great fun and, and lovely to see lots of old friends as well. Yeah, great. Thank you all. And thank you, Lynn. Of course, when I say old friends, I mean friends from a long time, not necessarily they're I, my age. <laughs> yeah, we, we have to always qualify. <laughs> thank you very much, Lynn. Relax.